Hi, um, my name is Salish, Salish Kataria. I'm independent. Um, thanks for the great report and lovely presentation by all of you. But um, one specific point with regards to Build Back Better or resilience or whatever terminology we use, by and large, from the um, lens of reducing risks and stuff, by and large, that's how I and uh, that's area, that's the angle I'm coming at it from. But the first point I wanted to make is, uh, Lian, in your report, by and large, you focused on um, Aceh, Myanmar, and Haiti. I just wonder if how different uh, or how um, angled a, a different perspective might have been provided if you'd included something like Gujarat mm -hmm. earthquake, where in these in these ones, by and large, donor-driven issues or issues between donors and the local authorities or local uh, civil society, etc., have been comp quite complex, whereas in mm -hmm. Gujarat, it was very much a, a, a government-led uh, effort, mm -hmm. which le re resulted in stronger communities, by and large, in sense, uh, stronger mm -hmm. uh, civil society, which already existed, so obviously mm -hmm. that was a requirement. Secondly, uh, better building codes, uh, community-led mm -hmm. planning, uh, urban planning, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So it, it would be quite interesting to hear that. Sure. And the second part is literally th this thing about uh, um, um, Priscilla's work with regards to what you mentioned about the framework, the new framework that you guys are working on. I hope that provides something because in some ways uh, what Lilian's work has mentioned is that uh, this is building back better or whatever is primarily about institutional change, mm. looking at those issues about political change. Mm. But the current processes like PDNAs and things like that just don't go there. That's it. I, I will end before. Thank you. To you and then back there. Uh -huh. Hi. Um, for my sins, I co-produced a book once. It was called Building Back Better <laughs> a couple of years ago. And I agree that there's a lot that needs explaining about that term. Um, mm. I also think that building resilience can raise a lot of questions because mm. a lot of people will explain it as just more resilient buildings. Mm. And it's about more resilient people, mm. really, for me. And I think that's also what we were trying to understand when we had thinking about building back better. Mm. It's about building as a process to get somewhere. Mm. The problem with much reconstruction is that people think about it as products. Yeah, We think about building houses, bits of infrastructure, nowadays jobs, if you think about a more integrated approach. But uh, there's, there's not enough thinking about the process that goes into getting there. And if we think about that process a little bit more, then maybe we can also build, start to think about it as a way of making the people more resilient. Um, two questions, two perhaps things we need to think about that a bit more. Uh, Lilian started with saying transformation is important, uh, very much in the beginning of your talk. and and. One of the questions for me is how much transformation can we achieve mm. if agencies are there only for like three years, which many of us are. Yeah? Doesn't change need a longer term. I disagree with Simon very much that agencies do, do not go back. We actually had a conference two weeks ago that was about research to go back many years after disasters, after reconstruction, and take the lessons from that. And one of the things that came out there is that if you really want change, you have to be in there for the longer term. And that's a big problem with the current funding for reconstruction. The second thing is governance. I haven't heard that word here. Yet, if, if we want m to have more resilient people, I think governance needs thinking about a little bit more. One of the problems I saw in Sri Lanka is Okay, it was good to have these agencies there almost from day zero, um, but it also what it cost is a very centralized approach to things. And, and complaints I heard from local people is that local institutions tended to often to get bypassed, and it included the local authorities, the CBOs, the local NGOs on the ground. They they didn't have that way into the change that needed to happen. Yes, you create, if you want change, you need to create what we in housing call enabling frameworks, and they have been around since 1976. 
uh, as thinking. And uh, so the, the, there is a role for government there, probably, but there needs to be also sufficient freedom and say at, at the local level. Thank you. Back there. Thanks, um, Katie Peters, ODI. Um, I had two questions. The first one was kind of playing devil's advocate. Um, I was just wondering whether you thought Build Back Better was sort of an unintentional recognition by the international community of a failure to prepare, reduce, transfer and mitigate disaster risk. Mm. Um, essentially, is it putting the attention in the wrong place? It's putting the attention after a disaster rather than before it. Mm. Um, and the second was similar to the gentleman just before me, which is actually, what do you think of the opportunities and the dangers of building back better governance structures? Because um, they actually tend to be the root causes of vulnerability rather than the hazard itself. Mm. Thank you very much. Uh, who wants to start? Do you answer? Priscilla, Lillian? I'll, I'll start. Lillian, sure. okay. Just very quickly, on Gujarat, I've actually read quite a lot about Gujarat, which has been you know, very encouraging. Uh, we didn't look at it in this paper because it didn't seem to be one of those places where the phrase build back better was used very much. Mm -hmm. We had considered looking at Pakistan, but you know, we didn't really have the luxury of having so many case studies either. So that's you know, really the reasons why we chose um, these, these three. But absolutely, Gujarat is a very uh, interesting example indeed. Um, so thank you for, for raising that. Um, the questions around, uh, yes, resilience, of building, building back better, or building resilience, or are we, you know, building, building actually the capacity of people to 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 recover, and how um, building should be really looked at much more as a process. I mean, I think that goes back to um, quite a lot of the. I, mean, I guess this discussion has been going on for a while. Shelter as process rather than shelter as a product, right? Um, Exactly, 40 or 50 years, that's right, that's right, before I was born, in fact. So, so it doesn't seem to me that, you know, that debate is entirely new, but somehow still it's, you know, the institutions that we've built and the architecture that we have around this international uh, disaster response. Um, I, I would like to think that it's improving, but I think we're not quite there yet. I think that the tendency still is very much to go in and, you know, look at a situation and regardless of the context think that there's a particular design and a product that you can just ship over and you know you'll solve the problem I mean, that was very much what we saw in in Haiti and you know I describe it in the report this kind of um, this this really sort of a blindness to to uh, the context and no real capacity to actually analyze what the specific problems were and design solutions around that but really sort of thinking well fast response means you know you're there quickly and you get your transitional shelters out there, which are these particular structures of a particular measurement and design, you know, regardless of if the fact if you actually ha can identify a place to put them or not. So I think we're, we're definitely not there. I think there's a recognition at, at you know, certain levels of, of uh, discussion. Um, but I think that there are s systemic problems, you know, particularly within um, the international architecture, within the cluster system, within, you know, that system that is uh, supposed to be really supporting and facilitating um, more effective responses. I think that there is there are blind spots that have emerged somehow, and and I hopefully the work that is going on currently to develop this um, disaster recovery framework could try to address that uh, uh, as well. Um, this whole issue about how much transformation is possible in those short time frames. I mean, I think that that's absolutely critical. But I would say, you know, it's it's also transformation by whom, right? So I don't think that the fact that international agencies are in a place for a very short period of time necessarily means that transformation won't be possible because I think it means, you know, perhaps focusing your ways of working in a way that you are actually working with actors who will be there for the longer term, not just the government, but private sector, civil society, all these other, you know, groups of um, uh, actors in, 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 lo in local societies who, who in fact will be there. And also regional um, actors as well. I mean, as we saw in the case of Myanmar, ASEAN uh, played a, a critical role and is still there playing a role in various capacities, that they're still involved in you know, supporting the Myanmar government with its um, capacity building and its systems uh, on disaster risk reduction. It's still there at the regional level. So there are ways, I think, of identifying actors uh, who will be there for the long term. Um, and then, of course, that relates to this whole question of governance as well. I mean, I think it's it's absolutely right that governance is is critical. And I did, um, you know, try to touch on that on the looking at specifically the the BRR example, but also the failure uh, of um, governance in in Haiti, uh, in spite of good intentions. You know, it still somehow didn't quite 
get to the point where there was a proper governance system in place and the exclusion of locals in Haiti. Whereas in Myanmar, in fact, you had um, quite a lot of careful thinking, maybe because of the lack of funding, in fact. You know, actors were so much more careful with where they put the very limited funding. It wasn't just sort of, you know, throw it into pet projects. There was real thought about where this funding goes and what it does. And, and even the international actors who were in Myanmar and able to work in Myanmar, many of them, um, they weren't, uh, they, they, you didn't have this enormous uh, number, but you did have people who had been there for a long time and really understood the context. So they took some time to really sort of identify you know, windows of opportunities for actually building partnerships with local organizations, trying to open up that space for the local um, organizations, for local private sector and for community-based organizations as well. So, you know, I think there are um, ways of actually doing that uh, which would be sustainable. Priscilla, Joe, do you want to tap into the question? I, um, if, if you don't mind, I wanted to point out that I believe um, on line observing this call is Dr. P.K. Mishra, who was the head of the Gujarat um, Redevelopment, I'm going to get the name wrong, the GDSA, I think. Um, and because he's a member of our uh, international advisory group. And he may have put some questions in, but he also sent me some comments on the report, um, which he may be reiterating in his own chat messages. But I think his concern um, was similar to mine, in fact. In some ways, I was sort of passing on his concern that um, it, it, whether this phraseology is useful or not, the focus on disaster risk reduction has to be at the fore. And I think if you really look at Gujarat and you look at some of the really exemplary things that were done, like the replanning of the downtown and um, various housing reconstruction projects, um, while some of the things that are exemplary are the participatory manner in which they were done and all of that. They were done with the end in mind, and the end was was largely risk reduction and risk management in that city. So, I mean, I don't pretend to speak to him, and you guys could have a great um, video conference simply talking to him because mm -hmm. he's got a wealth of information about that whole situation. Yeah, Joe. And I, I need to say yeah. that um, the the bank system cuts me off at the time that I said this would be over, <laughs> so I only have five more minutes. So I just want to say thank you in case I get so. cut off. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll try to get you some more questions soon. Yeah. Uh, Joe, do you want to tap in? Um, this? I just I just wanted to um, add two comments. Um, the first is is the issue of of resilience as a as an alternative to build back better. Resilience is as useless a term as sustainability. You know, it was the S word and now we've got the R word. Um, the conference is about to end. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary, yeah? That's really scary. Um, the, but, um, and you know, and not least because it's, it's an impossible word, word to translate. And I've tried that with Indonesians, Vietnamese, Indians, and I'm going to think where I'm going to now one more, Vietnam, um, Thai. So four tables in a, in a seminar of those four nationalities and asked them to come up with what resilience means to them. Mm. And it was untranslatable, which convinced me that as a term, I should never use it unless I'm in a room full of English speakers. But I think as a concept, as an intellectual concept, yeah. it is fundamentally extremely important. Mm. In the same way that sustainability as an intellectual concept that recognizes the limitations of living, all of us living on one planet was important. But we need to be able to articulate resilience mm -hmm. in a way that is meaningful to the people that we're talking to. And so we need to break it down into what does it actually really mean in practice. Um, and the work that we've been doing uh, with the International Federation of the Red Cross, which actually has got traction across the whole Red Cross movement, so there must be some success in it. Um, and then the work we're trying to do at a city scale is trying to do that unpacking. Mm. And then to, the city work is trying to go the step further, which is then to say, can we measure resilience? 
so we can actually place it out there as a goal that we're aspiring to and actually monitor our efforts to achieve it, mm -hmm. recognising that it's the cumulative effect of multiple actions and interventions. It's not a one-off hit, um, and history is part of it. The second thing I'd just like to, to, to respond to is the question about you know, transformation and can it be achieved when agencies are you know, only there for a short term. And linked to that is, you know, is the Build Back better putting, putting the emphasis on the after, not the before? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the real challenges is we've lost sight about what post-disaster response is about. Mm. Um, it's founded, post-disaster response is founded on needs assessments. It's governed by humanitarian principles, and its primary, uh, primary purpose is to prevent further loss of life, alleviate suffering, and reduce immediate vulnerability. It's very clear. But when we start moving to wanting transformational change or thinking about recovery, it's not just the why is different. It's actually what do we need to know mm. as our baseline information. And it's not, needs assessment is not the baseline for recovery. It is much more to do with capacity. What is local capacity? What are the local capacities that we can build on? What are the structural and institutional vulnerabilities that are in the system that we need to address as part of the process? And who are the key stakeholders that actually need to be at the table? Because actually, if we actually mapped those on day one, we wouldn't end up with a disconnect between mm. a donor community and a government community and a you know, a local civil society community, if we actually sat down and said, who needs to be at this table and part of this um, conversation? And the, the group that for me are always left out, that are hugely important in post-disaster situations, are local universities, where there is a wealth of, of knowledge and interest and levels of engagement. Mm. Um, and actually getting them around the table mm. is really important. Um, and then the other group that is missed out completely um, uh, is, or too often, is the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I take that at two levels. One is the local private sector, which is business, you know, mm -hmm. particularly where there are cha chambers of commerce and things that can actually unite them, um, as well as small, small businesses. But the other is actually the knowledge that exists in the global private sector mm -hmm. on how to recreate mm -hmm. um, communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that Europe did not get reconstructed after World War II by humanitarian agencies. It got reconstructed as a result of a lot of uh, engagement uh, between the public and the private sector. Mm -hmm. And that's the type of model I think we need to be thinking about. Mm. Fantastic. Thanks. We do have two questions uh, from, from the, the internet. One is from Pramod Mishra, which was the one that was mm, Director General Gujar Institute for Disaster Management that Priscilla was mentioned. And he says, and I'm reading out, my comments are based on the experience of overseeing a large uh, disaster recovery program. And uh, is worthwhile spending time and energy to define and analyze BBB? Is the same problem arise with defined uh, disaster risk reduction, um, even with the theme resilience as a problem, he says. Why uh, did not, uh, 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 my question is, why uh, not the o did not the author try to study some aspects of implementation and impact of the recovery project? Would not that be more meaningful and somewhat um, um, less abstract? I mean, mm -hmm. impact and evidence base. And then we have another question which says that, um, do the panel think that is enough investment and should be the local community to teach them how to develop and rebuild their community themselves, which can create a new industry in the relief somehow? So maybe were you, were you thinking if there's any one else to add? And then we'll, please. Up to, 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 to. Uh, people should hear you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Karen Whitus, and I'm a I have a couple of affiliations, but I think what's important for this uh, is that I've worked for many years in the sort of rule of law and justice sector, including in Aceh and in Haiti, and what's even more important is I've been working in Haiti on various things for over 30 years, so probably before some of you guys were born. Before the earthquake, after the earthquake, uh, and I grew up in an earthquake zone, so anyway, I don't know what that has to do with it. But one of the things I wanted to talk about, I think it was really interesting that Joe mentioned this issue of justice and the legal sector. And it's too bad Priscilla's gone because I would have thought this would be a bit of a suggestion for her framework they're working on. 
the organization I was working for previously worked both in Aceh uh, and in Haiti, trying to work on the underlying legal structures, particularly in land and property, mm -hmm. that block or stymie the reconstruction effort. Because whether you disagree or you like Build Back Better, you can't build anything if these legal issues aren't resolved. And what I, my question kind of for her and maybe for you is why there's so much pushback? Because the tsunami in Aceh was at the end of 2004, coincidentally on my birthday. Um, it took my organization about two years to convince donors and various people that it was worthwhile having legal expertise in there to work on things like inheritance issues because the reconstruction was kind of stopped short at some point because it was so unclear who owned the underlying land and what you could build on. And we learned from that and we said, okay, after the thing happened in Haiti, we said we got to go now. And, and I think within about 10 days we were on a plane. The pushback we received, particularly from some of our donors, we stopped in Washington on the way down to Port-au-Prince. I went with a colleague who had worked on our Aceh tsunami project for a couple years. He knew post-disaster from that point of view. He knew the cluster system, and I went with my expertise in Haiti. We received pushback from the international community like you couldn't believe. And it was, no, 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 it's too early. We don't need lawyers. You'll be in the way. We have to do humanitarian work, which was true. We stayed with a friend because we didn't you know, take a valuable hotel space. And it was my first encounter with this cluster system from the UN because I haven't worked in that before. And I have to say I was shocked and horrified. And I don't want to offend anyone who worked there because people meant well. But we were the outsiders. Even though we came from an intergovernmental international organization, we were not part of the UN cluster system. They kind of made us honorary members of the WASH group, whatever that was. Um, and I was quite horrified by two things, and I think Joe alluded to this, and, and I appreciate it, and I think your paper also does, and then I'll stop talking. Um, the incuriosity of the people staffing those clusters about the local context and even history and needs. Um, people said things like, well, we're building these tea set shelters. And long-term expatriates, people who lived in Haiti for 30, 40 years, so bridged that divide, said, but you know, there is no such thing as temporary in Haiti. You can't have, and, and, and people were like, oh, no, 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 we've done this all over the world, it's just fine. So two questions, one is why you think there's so much pushback and a reticence to take that lesson learned and go, yes, that should be part of the initial um, response to disaster because we know there's going to be problems down the line if we don't address it straight away. Um, and, and I don't know how you work on inclusiveness, but certainly we saw in Haiti it's, it's been a, a major problem. Thank you very much. Who wants to start? Can I? Sure. Sorry, I'm, I'm, really, I'm going to push in and go first because I'm actually supposed to have left. I'm supposed to be on a train, so as soon as I speak, I'm going to run away and, and, and leave you all. I was promised I could leave at, uh, at 3.30. <laughs> Um, very, very quickly. Re rebuilding governance and whatever. I want to say quick. I'm a bit uncomfortable with the word governance lately. I used to, to use it a lot and I don't anymore. Um, it's a bit sort of technical and engineering. You know, we're going to re engineer societies and so on. And I much prefer the word things like power and institutions because it's much harder to. Kind of to it's very easy to say we're going to go in there and we're going to run some good governance capacity building workshops. But it's, not, you know, but it's not so easy to say we're going to go in there and run some power sharing, you know, changing power situation, capacity building workshops. And the fact that you can't even think how to say it probably strikes you that, you know, probably means that we shouldn't be thinking about doing it. So I think that there's a, the issue of power and an and, and institution, I think, is important, and we do talk about them a lot. Whether governance is a language for, for it probably is about as relevant as BBB. It's kind of, fact, last point, li um, why on earth are we so uncurious? I love that question. Why are we so incurious? Why don't we, we, we don't want to deal with complexity. Um, I, well, you can all pick up my paper on, on your way out. Funnily enough, <laughs> avoiding reality is out there. I tried to look at that, exactly that. Why? And I think there's lots of reasons which I won't go into, but if, you, if you're interested, ha have, have a look. But I would make one s tiny, tiny point on, on the legal and on the land stuff, which is, um, I just want to, to make it relevant to the Build Back Better as opposed to other stuff. Um, 
And that is the, the, need, the critical need where, uh, from the very, very beginning for in a disaster like Haiti or, or the Philippines or whatever, to have the legal expertise to understand what is going on at 100%. And it, I mean, it's, your, your horror is the only emotion. I mean, hold it. Don't ever lose the horror uh, the, the, the way we do things because it, it, I mean, it is ridiculous. There's no other word for it. However, that's, I, I don't think, and I'm not saying that, that, that you said we should, but there are, I do hear people who think that post disaster, oh good, we can go in and we can, we can actually put right the land situation. <laughs> it's a perfect opportunity to go in there, you know, demarcate all the rights, title it, and give everyone over, and now it's all going to be fine. So if you like, building back better the, the, the land system. And I think that is, it, it, it does need doing, you know, but the one time when you shouldn't be doing it is post disaster. Because it's a time, you know, let, let, let's get things calmed down, and it's a 20-year project to sort out, and when you've got up, you can do it. Sorry, I've got to run. I'm not being rude. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thanks a lot. Um, Joe, Lillian? Um, I was in, uh, interested by your comment um, about the legal expertise, because when I was working in Sri Lanka, it was for UNHCR, and, you know, they're awash with legal experts and I was the only shelter expert. Um, but it was a very interesting environment to work in because it, it, it moved my thinking on shelter into a completely new domain, um, both in terms of they didn't understand shelter until we talked about it as part of protection, and then it, it moved it into a different domain. And also just having access to that legal expertise. So when issues like the coastal planning zone came up, there were really informed people who could create a coherent argument based on the facts as to what was right or what was not right. Um, the, the astonishment that you expressed that donors don't understand that legal expertise um, is needed is echoed by my own experiences um, in the aftermath of Haiti, where I still stand dumbfounded that that disaster happened in a significant urban settlement, a city, and yet there were not urban planners and, in, and infrastructure engineers at the table mm. right from day one in terms of analyzing that, um, analyzing the different typologies. Um, we got involved um, something staggering, like 16 months after the event, having knocked on endless doors and did a typology analysis of Port-au-Prince saying that you know, there's, there's hilly bits and there's flat bits and there's vulnerable bits and all the rest of it. But it's stuff that people with the right expertise, they just see. And you know, with a few hours of work or a walk around a city, they will come up with a real deep contextual understanding you know, of what you know, that, that other people won't see. So involving a key experts at the beginning um, is, it, it is important, I think, to combine the global expertise with the local perspective and put both of those round a table to inform the strategy. Fantastic. Lillian. Yeah, just a, a few uh, quick comments. I wanted to respond to um, Mr. Mishra and his question about why we didn't look at impact. I mean, we did think about uh, you know, whether to do a study that would look more at sort of impact and go out there and really kind of look at projects or whether to, in fact, look at something which looked a bit more conceptually at what agencies and what different actors thought they were doing. And we decided to go with the latter because we, we actually think that you know, a lot of the reasons why things weren't um, perhaps always as effective as we'd all hoped they might be has a lot more to do with the way we conceptualize things rather than just the way we're implementing things. So that's the reason why uh, we decided to do a paper um, that was a bit more conceptual rather than, than sort of looking at you know, sort of project level. Um, uh, but absolutely, I think uh, you know, looking at um, Impact is incredibly important, and I do hope that there are, um, you know, uh, other uh, actors involved in this um, uh, this type of work who are who are who are precisely doing so. Um, but I think it links, in fact, to you know some of your absolute um, you know astonishment and, and, in fact, as Simon said, your horror in, in some of the blindness, um, which uh, you know you certainly saw in Haiti and uh, and and I saw as well, and you know. I'm, I really thank you for bringing up the importance of the legal issues and, and land issues. I mean, that's suddenly something very close to my heart, and it was the issue that I've worked on, and I myself have trained as a legal anthropologist, and when I go into any of these settings, that's really what I look for, you know, legal issues and law um, in all its forms, formal and informal, 
um, and the ways in which you know uh, customs and practices really um, you know uh, should in fact be understood by by you know any actor who's who's engaged in in those types of contexts um, and and absolutely I, I mean I think that there isn't a, a systemic blindness to um, not just the legal issues, but to context in general. And it's it's still it's really quite astounding because you know practically every report that comes out, you know, certainly of this uh, um, group, um, the humanitarian policy group. But I'm sure you know lots and lots of um, you know critiques that have been done um, on on you know conflict and disasters elsewhere too keep stressing the importance of understanding context. And I think you know we realise that, but somehow we haven't been able to shift it into our, our systems. You know, somehow the systems we can, you know, when we're here sitting here in London, we can sit and read the context. But when you're out there, op, you know, in the operational response, you just don't have time. You know, you're you're completely burdened with all of the requirements of, uh, you know, just managing and coordinating yourselves. So actually, you become incredibly, you know, sort of navel gazing at your system and are you running your system properly? And I think that the system is designed for that, which is so incredibly dangerous. And you know, it really does. Um, you know, blind actors to problems that are really out there. And, and I do encourage you to pick up Simon's report because it looks exactly at how this problem plays out in um, uh, issues around uh, land and how agencies engaged with uh, land issues in, in Haiti um, and couldn't actually deal with it. You know, they, they saw it as this enormous problem, identified it as a problem, but then tried to impose perfect responses, you know, tried to look at, well, what's the ideal... Um, you know, what is the situation that you really need? You really need to get, you know, titles for everything. You, you know, you have to, to stop all evictions. You have to, instead of actually thinking very strategically and pragmatically. And they would have been able to think more strategically, more pragmatically, if they had, you know, been a bit more flexible with the universal principles, um, you know, been a little bit more, uh, and certainly opened up their, their systems, the coordination systems, to really listening to people who understood the context, you know, both international and um, local actors who actually understood the context better. And as Joe was mentioning, you know, this, this, Divide. I mean, the fact that you didn't even have urban planners, um, and and this is you know urban planners um, who knew Haiti, uh, uh, people who know that type of environment, uh, people who are used to working in in informal settlements. Um, they were really largely absent. I, I I would say. I mean, you know, they showed up in some of the shelter cluster meetings, but they were by no means the ones sort of strategically helping to design, um, you know, what the response was going to look like. Unfortunately, so I, I think that there really are some very serious. Um, you know, questions uh, that that the system itself, those of us involved in the system um, and critiquing the system, need to really be thinking about. You know, there has to be some way of actually, you know, redesigning things and shaping things. And you know, I like to try to be optimistic, as as you know, um, pessimistic as one can get, looking at these kinds of situations. But I think that if there's a commitment at, um, you know, at, at all levels, which really means international, all the way down to local levels as well, um, you know, that there's something wrong with the way response has been going and, and particularly in some of these cases. I think that there are ways of making sure that we're really fixing the problems. Where are the bottlenecks? And it, it does need to be all people around the table. You know, all the people who are usually left out, you need, they need to be there. The local communities, private sector, the urban planners, you know, wh whoever's not actually been around the table so that we, we actually move away from this kind of incredibly bifurcated, fragmented um, approach, which, as we've seen, just doesn't work. Fantastic. If there is any pressure in question, I'm calling to a close. And um, um, I'm very happy because we reopened the Pandora's box about the debate on to build back better and resemble my early uh, experience with the linking relief and reconstruction and development at the early 90s. And I think that we have a hell of a lot of uh, understanding and report and empirical evidence and good cases uh, that call for two fundamental uh, points that Lilian put in a sort of hidden sentence at the end of the report in the conclusion, where she says that we need a critical revision. And I do think that we continuously need a critical revision on whatever we think without understanding being a silos, being resilience, or being whatever new term we're going to use and an engaged dialogue. And I think we continually need to have a dialogue. We're not simply talking to each other and inviting people on a table, but being engaged. And I think that today was a very engaged dialogue. So thank you very much, and thanks all the panelists. And thanks for the great question on the internet. Thank you.